Hello and welcome to episode one of Disrupt's FinTech podcast series, Fireside Chat with King's Crowd. My name is Isaac Gautian, and I am joined by Sean Aurora and Vedanshi Shah, who will be co-moderating this discussion. Today, our special guest is Chris Lostrino, the founder and CEO of King's Crowd. King's Crowd is the first independent ratings and analytics platform for the online private markets. Chris is a Boston College Eagle for life. He's on a mission to democratize startup investing for all people at King's Crowd, and he has a passion for fintech investing and social impact. Thank you, Chris, for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me here, Isaac. I'm uh, really looking forward to the conversation. All right. With all that being said, Chris, can you provide an overview of what uh, King's Crowd does? Absolutely. Um, so very excited to be here. I think, you know, it's a really important podcast to have um, to tell folks about something that's kind of been emerging for the last five to six years here and is really helping to reinvent finance from my perspective um, and wealth creation here in the United States. So um, about five years ago, new rules were created that said, let's take the venture capital asset class, which has traditionally been reserved for millionaires and major institutions, and let's make it accessible to everybody. Let's let any American with $50 be able to own the next Google, the next Uber, the next Airbnb when they're still in a garage. Because that is truly the moment at which companies have the most potential to grow and create lasting wealth creation for individuals. And that's something that's never been accessible to anyone other than the major institutions and people who are already very, very rich. So when those rules came about, what we saw was this proliferation of new marketplaces that essentially you could think of as your NASDAQ or New York Stock Exchange for startup investing. And that to us was really exciting. I'm talking about marketplaces like WeFunder.com, Republic, Seed Invest, Start Engine, so on and so forth. And you should definitely go and check those out, put them in the show notes. Um, and so when we saw that, we thought, hey, there is an opportunity here to build a Bloomberg-like tool for gathering all of the data, all of the deal flow, putting it in one place and providing all the capabilities you need to search, diligence, and manage your new startup investment portfolio. So that's what we're all about here at King's Crown. That is amazing. Um, thank you so much for telling us about it. Um, could you also tell us a little bit more about yourself and how you got here? I know you kind of alluded to that a little bit. As you mentioned, you know, I went to Boston College undergrad. Um, and when I left, you know, one of the things that I absolutely loved about being at Boston College is they always talk about being men and women for others. Um, and I really wanted whatever work I did to have some meaningful impact on the world, something that would make the world a better place. Um, and so when I started out in management consulting, I was learning a lot for my own self, but I didn't necessarily feel as though I was really changing the world by any means. Um, and oftentimes was working for these major private equity firms, helping them do their diligence so that they could make other large institutions even richer. And when I was sitting there looking at what was being done, it hit me that nothing we were doing was rocket science. It certainly wasn't overly challenging. And I thought, boy, here's this really powerful asset class and it's completely hands off to the everyday American. And there's no reason that it has to be. What if we pushed the needle forward and said everyone should be able to access this because it's truly something that can be transformational. I mean, to give you an example, if you invested, I believe, about $50 in Uber and it's like first round of funding when it was worth $3 million, when it went public, you would have made over a million dollars. And that just tells you the level of potential there is when you're investing in really early stage companies. And so, you know, I, I think it's very rare in life that you get to be in the right place at the right time with the right thought. Um, and have all of those things line up. And when I saw this problem and started thinking about it, I thought, my goodness, I'm seeing the birth of a brand new market that didn't exist until five years ago. And I'm at the exact spot in time and in life that I need to be in order to build something really transformational for this space that no one is building yet. So I ended up starting a FinTech blog to start that focused on this new industry. And then at the right time, I ended up getting a phone call back in 2018 from one of the founders of Napster and, and he asked me if I'd wanna start a company in this space. And it was that last impetus I needed to say, I need to commit to this market and do something that can really benefit men and women for others, right? Do something really positive for the world. And, um, and it's been an amazing journey since. That's really cool, Chris. Um, I think maybe a lot of people might be interested in the name. So do you mind going over the name, explaining about like how that came about and what it means? Absolutely. 
So the idea here is that, you know, before what's called the Jobs Act was created and before these marketplaces like Republic and WeFunder were created, um, there was no way for the crowd, the individual, the retail investor, the non-accredited investor, whatever you want to call it, to be able to access these markets. Um, and, you know, a king is, is a rich individual. So the idea is everyone can invest like a rich individual. Um, and so that's really kind of where, where the name came from. Yeah, that's really creative. Um, so would you be able to walk us through the different stages of growth King's Crowd has experienced since you founded the company in 2018? Absolutely. Um, you know, when we started out, it was a struggle, a struggle by <laughs> every measure that you could think of. Um, imagine trying to build a company that is trying to disrupt an industry that has benefited from being opaque, that has benefited from high fees that people don't fully understand, um, that has benefited by living offline um, and not being accessible. And us coming in and saying, we want to fuel a new market, a market that pushes down fees, that makes the world more transparent, and that allows a lot more people to partake and invest in this space, thus making it a lot more competitive. Um, I certainly was not the favorite founder on the block. Um, and, you know, they, they always say, oh, we'll always invest in the best founder, even if the idea is B plus or whatever. Um, that was not the case for us. We, we got a lot of rejection. I mean, I have pitched King's Crowd well over 2,000 times since we started the organization. Um, and I can promise you nearly all of those have been no's. But we prevailed anyway. Um, you know, in our first year, we raised a little less than $200,000. Um, and, you know, it was basically two of us working on it at the time. In the second year, we had about four employees um, and we raised about a million bucks. And that was really exciting. And then COVID hits and thinking, oh, my gosh, now what are we going to do? And then just fueling our growth through COVID, we ended up acquiring four companies along the way. We've grown to over 400,000 total subscribers, thousands and thousands of paying customers. Um, we've now raised over six million dollars to date. Uh, including over $4 million in our Series A. And we've done this all online. We've allowed nearly 4,000 individuals to invest and own well over a third of our entire business. Um, so we're really proud of what we've done. And we've created something really unique that's never been done before for investing in private companies. That is extremely fabulous um, and very inspiring. Um, speaking of like being proud of that and um, that's a great thing. Uh, what else like, are you most proud of about King's Crowd? So if you look at our team, I would say it is a world-class team. I mean, the folks that we have working on our team today are, are the brightest minds and the people you would want building this business. I'm talking about folks like the former chief counsel officer of Bank of America, the former CTO at the Dow Jones Business Intelligence Group. One of our advisors is the former chief investment officer at the city. Um, we obviously have the founding chairman and CEO of Napster as one of our key advisors and investors. And we have brought some incredible people onto our team and then tons and tons of young talent as well. Um, you know, venture capitalists are always struggling to figure out how to make their teams more diverse. Our investment research team, which is essentially our internal venture team, is actually more female than it is male. And we have people from around the world. We have people from Jordan. We have people from Iraq. Um, we have people from France. So I'm really proud of the team that we built because really all a company is, is a collection of folks working together towards a common goal. Chris, I was, I was really interested by the point that you said that you pitched to over 2000 companies. And like, I feel like that's something that is really tough. And I feel like, like students, like younger people all the time, you know, kind of go out after five or six rejections. So I was just wondering what advice you would give to someone who's having a startup and is dealing with rejection and like what, what can you say to them to make them to keep going? You know, the, the media portrays this thing that it's like you pitch a handful of times and you get millions of dollars. A few people are anointed and, you know, early on get all the money they need in the world and all the connections they need and everything is hunky dory. I will tell you that is not the case for the vast, vast, vast majority of founders. Most people are grinding away for years on end, struggling, almost running out of money, you know, never finding an easy break. That's the actual reality of building a business. And that's why I believe so strongly that whatever it is you're doing, you have to believe very passionately that what you're doing is the right thing to be working on and that you feel it's going to make a difference because the going is going to get tough from day one and it only gets harder and harder and harder and harder. Um, but just know that that's normal. 
that's completely normal. And as long as you're okay dealing with that, and when I say that, I mean, you know, if you're building a company you truly believe in to be transformational and can do all of these good things, then you keep with it. If you don't believe in it, there's nothing that's going to hold you there because I will tell you the best and worst days of your life will happen while building a company. So it seems that stubbornness and dedication are kind of key aspects of what founders need to be to become successful. So what are other positive characteristics shared by most successful startup founders that's a clear indication of future success? Wow, that's a very good question. Um, you know, I would say at the end of the day, your, your job as a founder and as a CEO is very few things. Um, it's to set a very clear vision. It's to set goals to work towards that vision. And then it's to inspire people to both invest and join your team to work towards that vision and execute on those goals. Um, and it means hiring people who are smarter than you. It's being humble enough to recognize that you know next to nothing. Having a great idea is like one one thousandth of what matters. The rest of it is all execution and you can execute and build a thing on your own. So being humble enough to know that you need to bring on other exceptional people around you who are more experienced and smarter than you to really build towards your goal and vision and then giving them the room to do so. So being an empathetic, thoughtful leader who listens to those that you bring on, that's what it's all about. So I look for people who are humble, who are listeners and who know enough to know what they don't know. That, that is very, um, like, very insightful and what to look at. Um, so um, speaking of, like, how did you, like, form the team um, and, like, form your team and what qualities did you look for um, when you were looking to expand your team and, like, how did you make those connections? So the most powerful asset that you have in any business is your team members. That's the whole thing. So for me, one of the best things that's come from hiring each team member is that each team member is then connected to a whole network of other individuals. And typically, if you hire wonderful people, they will gen generally know and recommend other wonderful people. Um, I'll give you a perfect example. I, one of our first, first hires was at, from Wellesley College and she joined our team and was incredible. And I said, my goodness, we need to hire more people just like you, can you help me find them? And so she started recruiting at her school. And so we've already hired two more and it continues to be a pipeline for us. So a big thing for me is finding referrals from the people who I already believe in and really like. And so a lot of our, our growth as a team has honestly been very natural. Um, and it's just been people that I've gotten to know over time. They come, they work for us. And then little by little, they bring other people who they know onto the team as well. And that's been the most powerful way to grow um, our team and our business. Because, um, you know, like talking about building a team, I think that when people are building a startup, like they're a bit wary of bringing on too many people right at the beginning, right? Like I know you said there was just two of you at the beginning. What do you think is like a good timeline for bringing on like not just a CEO, but like programmers, devs, like graphic designers, like at what time during a startup's life cycle do you think that it makes sense to bring on more and more people? It's interesting. I mean, it, it certainly is a situational thing. So you know, if you start a business and you are one of those companies that just out of the gate takes off and, you know, you're getting people ringing the phone to you just to invest in your company, that looks very different than what our business was. So in those instances, you know, you're in a position where you have to go and make those hires um, and you're going to have to do it sooner rather than later. And that can be a very scary and intimidating thing. And oftentimes I do think it could be one of the pitfalls because when you're trying to move fast with people, um, you can make mistakes and that's probably not the best thing. We've been fortunate where, you know, in some ways, because we had to take our growth slower over the first kind of three years of the business, we had an opportunity to grow organically. And I actually think it's really, really good. Um, at the same time, you know, if your situation calls for you bringing people on right away, then you have to do so. But for me, being in the position we were, what it was always about was thinking about what is the greatest next necessity on our list? I knew the pieces we needed. We needed people to research all of the investments we're looking at that are going in our database. We needed technologists to build the product that we had. We needed marketers and salespeople to push the, the business forward. So each time I was just looking at one of those three buckets and saying, what's the most necessary need? And then do we know someone that really fits that profile that we're excited about? So I know that you have a passion for social impact. You were also saying before how you're really proud how King's Crowd has this diverse team. 
So how does King's Crowd make efforts to promote uh, impact investing in minority founders? Happy you said that. So actually this past week, um, just to help you understand this market, there are about 40 marketplaces where you can now and go and invest in, in startups. There's on any given day, you could wake up and there's almost 700 companies that you and I can invest in on any given day. There's almost 50 new companies each week that are launching new raises on these platforms. And again, most of the minimum minimums to own equity in these businesses are $100 to $250. So we aggregate all 700 companies that are actively raising capital. Then we provide ratings and analytics on them so you could do your own diligence on those businesses. One of the things that we heard from folks was that they wanted to be able to find and invest easily into female and minority businesses um, we like to now kind of bucket them as well internally as underestimated founders, right? Because there's no charity being done here by investing in a female and minority founder. They're simply underestimated and overlooked way too many times. Um, you know, in the traditional venture world, you're looking at 2% of funding going to female founders. In this world, it's closer to 25 to 30% of funding. So we've already 10x improved uh, from the traditional market what we're seeing. So what we did though, was we have essentially a table where people can search and filter for the things they care about, industry, valuation, so on and so forth, so that your search process becomes really efficient. So the new thing that we added is we have a female founder, a minority founder, and a social impact button filter so that you could filter just for those businesses that fit your criteria. That is so creative. Um, that I was also curious on, um, could you, if you could share some like, or, or how your platform works, like what other um, market readings and analytical metrics do you use um, for people to kind of um, get uh, get started? Absolutely. So there are over 500 data points that we collect on each company. Um, most of these companies are pre-seed through like series B. Um, so what we do is we aggregate all of the data on those companies. And in order to raise capital from the general public, you have to file certain information that has to be publicly available. I'm talking about things like income statement, balance sheet, cash flows, who owns what of the company, um, amount of money they're trying to raise, and then visually show you how much money actually has been raised and how many investors are partaking. That type of information has never been available on private companies. Usually you can't learn anything about a business um, when, they're, when they're private. So we have this plethora of data that we've never had before. So we collect all of that in a structured way. And then we go out and we do our own exercises like doing a market sizing effort, right? So we say, okay, what's the actual addressable market? We'll use third-party sources and we'll do our own research. We'll do, okay, what's their market growth rate? And we'll figure that out. Um, we'll look at the founders. We'll look at what school they went to. If they've worked with the, the founders before that are on their team, look at how big their team is. Do they have the right pieces? Do they have any exits? All of that type of information, we build that up in our own database. And then what we do is we bucket all of those 500 data points into about five key categories. And we're talking about things like market size, terms of the deal, founder experience, so on and so forth. And what we do is we compare and contrast the businesses against one another. So for instance, if you are a seed stage company and there's another seed stage company and you're in a billion dollar market and they're in a $5 billion market, you, the, the company with a $5 billion market will get a better rating on market size than you will with a $1 billion market. So that's kind of how the algorithm works. And then every company gets a score between one and five and you can see the breakdown of why they got that rating. Chris, um, I was also wondering if you can talk a bit about the future. Um, of King Crowd and like kind of where you see it in the next three months and then where you see it in a year? Sure. So definitely see us, you know, closing most, if not all of our Series A, which is $15 million round. As I mentioned, we've, we've raised about 4 million of that already. Um, most of that in the past few weeks. So we're making a ton of progress there. Um, and we have a couple of major announcements that I, I can't say just yet uh, that we'll be making as well in the next few months. I mean, my goal, you know, in the next year is really to kind of five or 10 X our business in terms of revenue, um, continue to grow our user base and add new asset classes and new product lines. Um, when I talk about new asset classes and product lines, what I mean is there is billions of dollars being transacted into real estate online today. There's hundreds of millions of dollars going into debt deals into companies. So like think of credit facilities, where a company's just trying to open up a new store and grow their revenues and it's a rev share type of deal. There is hundreds of millions of dollars going into things like collectibles. 
Uh, I'm talking about art, wine, uh, baseball cards, cars, so on and so forth. And so we want to begin adding all of those other asset classes that folks can trade into onto our platform. And then we want to start to expand into new product lines. The, the best product line and the one I'm most excited about is our capital division. So we're sitting on all of this data, we're sitting on all of these ratings, and we're seeing how the companies perform against our metrics. And we're seeing that we're relatively good at what we do. And so we're actually creating diversified fund products so that folks can get one click diversification into 50 or 100 companies that are highly rated by King's Crowd, making it really easy for you to get strong exposure into the private markets. So what is an example of a hot deal that King's Crowd has identified? I'll give you a, a good example. Um, there's a company called NowRx. Uh, this is a company that has raised, I think, nearly every dollar since they started the business uh, via seed invest. And NowRx is essentially an automated pharmacy business that grew from an idea on a piece of paper where they're like, we're going to use robotics and you know, this fleet of cars to basically deliver your medicine to your door within hours of going to the doctor, sometimes before you even get home. Um, and it's gonna make it lower cost, better adherence to, to medication, so on and so forth. They started with this idea and they've grown to this business that's probably doing, geez, I don't know, 30 or $40 million in revenue now, just a few years down the line. Um, and they went from a company that was valuing themselves at maybe $20 million in that first round of funding and is now north of $250 million. Um, and I think has a long, long way to run. Um, that's one business. Another business, Alto IRA. They were essentially creating the first uh, alternative RIA tool where you could easily invest into things like crypto and startups via all of these new online marketplaces. I think when you know it was highly rated by King's Crowd, it was like a $30 million valuation. I think they just finished the Series B at like a 200 or $250 million valuation. We're talking about a year and a half since that, that round of funding had happened. So We've seen some really, really nice wins as of recent. That, that's so exciting. Um, I was also kind of curious, like, how do you motivate your team to go that extra mile and like, um, you know, keep working? I think the most important thing you can do as a founder is to find great talent and empower them to kind of own the day. Um, so I, I set the vision. I say, here's where we're headed. This is the grand vision. This is what we want to build. Here's how we change the world. That gets buy-in on that, that impact element, right? So I would say every person that's on our team cares about impact and changing the world in some positive way, but then recognizing their role and how we make that happen. So once you do that, then it's literally about giving them the room and autonomy to run and learn and build and falter and all of those things. Um, but being okay with that. And so letting them know that it's okay to move fast, to break things, and that they're not going to get in trouble. We want them to learn from experience. We want them to learn from trying things and giving them that space to do so. So I'm a very much a non-micromanager. I'm very much a believer in giving you that vision, setting your goals, and then letting you run free. And as long as you're learning and growing, you know, you might stumble a few times. That's okay. Um, all we care about is that we're, we're moving forward. We're pushing things forward and we're getting closer and closer to our goals. Cool. Uh, Chris, I was also wondering if you can talk a bit about the pricing model, like about the freemium model and like um, maybe numbers on like percentage of people that um, go from free to starter and generally how long that takes for someone to be converted into like a starter level. You know, there, there's kind of a couple of different uh, buckets of customers that we'll have. So you have those people who come to you like almost frantically looking for your product. Um, as you can imagine, there's really no other product in our market today that does what we do. So a lot of times the way folks find us is literally Googling whatever company they're looking to invest in, you know, now our Exxon Seed Invest Diligence, and then they find our report. Um, and they're just so thankful to have someone else looking at the deal that they'll automatically buy us because they're active investors in this market. There's the other type of investor that's a lot less active hears about a company maybe through a friend or something and thinks this is cool to dabble in, but isn't necessarily ready to commit to the market in general and invest in startups in a broader way. And so for those folks, it could take you know, anywhere from one to four or five months for them to really say, you know what, there's something here. I'm educated enough now. I'm excited. I think I'll actually purchase the paid product. And then we kind of have a range of price products where it starts at $10 and it goes up to $50 a month. Um, ironically, what we find is I think over 50% of our paid customers are going to the high paid product because our user is someone that is investing very actively in this space 
and is making 14 to 15,000 plus dollar bets a year. Um, and so for them, spending that five, $600 to kind of protect themselves from making poor investment decisions is worthwhile. Um, and then we kind of have our starter group that has less money to deploy. You know, it doesn't want to have a, a big chunk of their investments go towards their diligence tool. And so they'll spend a bit less money month to month, pay $10 a month. Um, and they're maybe looking to do, you know, five to six deals a year. Um, and so that, that's kind of how it works out. So I know you have your own podcast, the King's Crowd Startup Investing Podcast. So can you speak about why you began this series and what it's taught you about startup investing? Sure. You know, our whole thing, our mission at its core is to empower everyone to invest with confidence into the private markets. Um, and big emphasis on everyone. So we don't want this to be a product that only works for the rich individual. We want to have products and tools and education that can reach the broadest audience possible. Because if we can teach people, even if they don't use all of the, the, the suite of products that we have, if they learn something from us, if they're empowered to invest into this market, we've done our job. Um, we want to teach people as much as we can. And so that all comes to education, education, education. And so having a free podcast where people can come and listen to active investors in the market, startup founders, providers in this space, and just hear from all of these folks about what's going on in the alternative investing world, you know, that empowers them. That allows them to say, okay, I think I actually know what's going on. This isn't so complicated. Um, and so for me, anything that does more of that is a good thing to do. Um, sorry, I was just curious, um, it, what was the challenge that you faced starting business and how would you navigate through it? I've faced many a challenge, <laughs> but I will tell you, you know, what you're trying to do early on is convince people that you have a great vision and a big market opportunity and that you're the right person to execute against that. Um, and, and what you learn very quickly as a founder is there is only so much you can do with next to no resources, right? You need people to develop, you need people to market, you need people to produce your product or your research or whatever it is. Um, and with no money, that's really, really hard. Um, when I was starting out, I had no resources, I had no cash. And so I ended up going back to Boston College and getting, I think about eight or 10 interns to help me do investment research on all of these companies because I didn't have a team yet. It was me writing the reports at night and then pitching all day. Um, and I knew that wasn't sustainable. I knew that wasn't going to take me far. Um, but when you have no resources, you know, they always say, what is it? Um, uh, not scarcity, but essentially, you know, when your back's up against the wall, that's the mother of all invention, right? You're forced to try and figure out what am I going to do to stay afloat, to stay alive, to see a day where I can actually see my vision come to life. Um, and I faced a lot of those moments, I would say for almost two years before we had our first real break. Um, and it was, it was a grind every day. I was winning one in $5,000 checks for months and months and months on end, making nothing or, you know, a pittance pay just to keep the lights on type of thing. Um, so I would say the first two years were extremely hard and filled with lots and lots of those kind of pitfalls and having to figure out how do I even get the work done? It's, it's really, it's really inspiring to hear that, honestly, uh, especially from, I think people in the Northeast community who are like very, very into startups and a lot of them just like struggle, like similar to you, but like, honestly, the story that you have is pretty crazy and it's crazy to see that you still like made it out with seed, with funding and all that stuff. So like, you know, I, I'm sure during this time you were pitching and like pitching and like you kept thinking about like, oh, like, how can I change this? How can I tweak this? Right. So like, um, when it comes to perfecting your pitch, what do you think is the best advice there? <laughs> Honestly, the biggest thing is to just get out there and do it. And I would talk to anybody. I didn't care. I didn't know how much money they had, if they actually invested. I would reach out to anyone and everyone on LinkedIn. I would go to any event and meet people and just talk to them about what I was working on. And really all I'm saying here is just practice, 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 but don't practice in a room to yourself. You could do that you know, before the first time you go out and pitch just practice by going and talking to people. You're never going to burn a bridge by having a bad pitch and it's all over forever. No, if you continue to progress that business and you reach back out to them and tell them about the progress you're making, 
all of those things in time can work itself out. But by getting out there and practicing with people, what happens is you get feedback and they tell you what they don't believe in. They tell you what holes they think there are and all of this stuff. People are very candid and real about it. And every time you just learn and learn and learn, you go, huh, okay, how do I answer for that the next time that comes around? I remember when I was starting out, you know, the way that I pitched the market was regulation crowdfunding, which is a world that we were starting in, is doing less than $50 million in capital raise per year. And they're like, this is the dumbest, smallest market ever. And you're a portion of that market. It's tiny. And I realized like, what a terrible way to pitch the business. It then hit me that there are $13 trillion in assets trading the private markets. And over the next decade, nearly all of them will move online. We're going to own the data for that entire world. That's a much more interesting story. But it took actually seeing how people responded to, hey, we're in a little market today and recognizing that I needed to talk about the big market that it was going to be. So just get out there and pitch as much as you can. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's very helpful. I feel like, uh, you know, like a lot of people do just try to perfect the pitch and they just do it to themselves and they're too scared to go out there. So I think it's really good advice. So this will be our last question. And I think it's a very important one for a lot of the college students who are listening to our podcast. What advice do you have for college students who are looking to enter FinTech? The greatest thing that you have on your side when you're in school is time. Um, and I know you're busy with school, but the reality is when you get out of school, um, kind of the, you know, the safety net goes away. You got to pay for housing. You have to pay for food. Like suddenly it's the real world and you're going to have to take care of yourself. AKA you're going to have to find money so that you can support yourself and live and, you know, push the business forward. In school, you have nothing but time. You have four or five years if you're at Northeastern to just tinker with ideas, try things out. And most people don't realize, again, that a lot of companies can go six months, 12 months before they raise any sort of meaningful dollar. And even that might not be a lot of money. So if you have years on your side to work on your pitch, to work on an idea, get those initial pieces in place, it doesn't have to be perfect. But at least you start to figure out exactly what your market is, what you're going to go after. You get to test it. You can work with other students who also don't need to be paid. You have no idea how valuable that is because your time suddenly becomes monetized when you're in the real world. But in school right now, it's still free. And that is like the most powerful thing you have on your side early on is time. Um, and then my, my only other thing I'd say to you is don't overcomplicate it. You know, don't overthink things. Keep it simple. Find a problem, think about what a solution would be to that problem and run with that. Don't try and make it anything more than that. So that's all the time we have for today. Thank you so much, Chris, for taking the time to join us for our first episode of Disrupt's FinTech podcast series. We're really grateful for all the wonderful insights you have given us about startups and FinTech. And we wish you and King's Crowd the best. We're really excited to see what the company becomes in the future. Thanks so much, Isaac. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you so much. You got it.